Okay, turn to the person next to you and say, open it. Open it. Open it, okay. Open it. Okay, so um, this time of year we talk about presents a lot, yeah? Uh, there's a lot of pressure on us to get presents for each other. You know, if you're married, you've got to get your wife the right present. And um, if you, you don't know whether it's going to be the right present until the day, and then on the day you realise it wasn't, and you have to get the receipt, and then they go and get what they really wanted in the first place. Um, but there's a lot of pressure on us at this time of year to, to go and get um, to get presents for one another. You know, there's there's a it's just the, the way that it's, it's happened, the way that uh, Christmas has become, and and um, and so we look at uh, okay, how, has anyone ever been in that situation where you are um, you kind of got a budget, and then someone starts reminding you of like someone else in the family. You think, oh, I didn't think of my great uncle Wally. You know. <laughs> He didn't know he was coming this year, or um, or like, or or then you think, okay, it's good. I've got the budget sorted out, and then people actually give you gifts, and then you're like, oh no, I've got to give a gift back now. Claire does this all the time. You know, she'll be like, what's the budget? I say, I think there's a budget for Christmas, okay? And then she'll be like, we have to get them something. They've got us something. I'm like, okay, bro, I'll take it out of yours, your present. <laughs> okay, so um, so there's a lot of pressure on us to get presents, and then. Um, not so much nowadays, although actually thinking about it, it does happen still. Um, usually your kids want the thing that everyone else wants. Have you noticed that one? So when you go to look for it, it's like a sold out everywhere. And then you end up being like, it's like that movie Jingle All The Way, where you've got to try and find that, that one gift in the whole of the country. You're traveling to Scotland to try and get it or something. And then when they open it on the day, you think you better appreciate it. And they don't, they play with the box. <laughs> or something. And then, uh, that's happened to me many times. Um, and you think, why do we bother? Why do we do this all the time? Presence is a big deal, but presence is also a big deal in the Word of God. And um, the Word of God is, uh, for presence is, is, is all, it's all, the whole Word is all about God's presence. It's all about God's presence. So we have a word for presence, for Christmas, but today I want to just share this message with you called Christmas Presence. And it's all about God trying to to um, meet with you. And the whole word of God from Genesis through to Revelation is all about God trying to meet with you, for you to know him intimately. So I'm just gonna go through, really quickly, just through this, the story um, of God's presence that's throughout the word briefly. It's gonna be a brief one-ish. And um, uh, I've gotta do it brief because the kids are gonna be um, attacking Mel in about 20 minutes. So. Right at the beginning, right at the beginning, um, God created us, and He created us. It says He created us in His image, but He created us to have fellowship with Him. He created us so that we would know Him intimately. That 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 the um, unity that is in in God he would be felt by humans. That we would have that unity and that connection with Him, and they and, and they wanted to share that with us, and uh, and that's why we were created. The whole point of, of, of him creating us, though, would be he could create us as robots. So he could just tell us what to do and we would do it without choice. Or he could create us with a choice. Therefore, making sure that the word relationship, you know, he's creating us for a relationship with him, would actually be true. See, um, I'm married, um, but if I was made to marry Claire, if I had to just, since I had no choice, I had to do it. I, I was made to do it, then that's not a relationship. That's a dictatorship. And, and you know, maybe I'll talk to you about my dictatorship marriage one day. Um, that's true. Um, but no, but seriously, we, we choose to have relationships. We have friends next to us, people next to us. We can choose to be friends with people or not. We have a choice. We choose who we have in our life. We choose who, who we don't want in our life. We have that choice. And it's the same with God. We can choose God to be in our lives or not. And God had to put that condition in, into the, um, the creating of us. He had to say, right, we want to create them. We want them to create them in our image. We want them to understand um, the unity that we have, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We want them to understand that unity that we have, that connection we have, that bond that we have. We want them to have that as well. But they have to be able to choose it. We can't just make them do it. So God puts conditions um, into the relationship. He says, you, there's a choice. You can choose me. Or you can choose your way. But it's your choice. 
And he's had that. That choice has been in place since the beginning of creation. We have a choice. We can choose him, but he's always had to put the alternative there. Otherwise, it's not a choice. If there's only one choice, if there's only one thing to do, that's not a choice. Yeah? You have to do it. There's nowhere else to go. So he has to say, you can choose you, your way, and work it out for yourself. You're welcome to do that. Or you can choose to have a relationship with me. Sometimes people think that God is just this angry God making us do things we don't want to do. But he didn't create us to go around telling us what to do or not, want to, not what to do. He created us to have a relationship with him. That's the whole point. And sometimes you think, well, why do you want to follow a God that tells you what you can and can't do? I don't follow a God that tells me what I can and can't do. I follow a God that, that chose to want a relationship with me. And I want to choose to have a relationship with him. And so there's choice that was put in there. And just like we all do, every human being on the planet... We chose to do it our way. You know, when we were, when we were born, I have children. Um, and um, very early on, I think me and Claire did a pretty good job um, of not really trying to make them try to, to lie or steal or do things they shouldn't do or hit their brother or hit their sister and think they can get away with it. We're pretty good at not really showing them that. But for some reason, they just found out how to do it. We think it could have been from Ian and Anne. But we can't, we're not 100% sure. But the truth of it is, is actually, it's just in our nature. It's just in our nature. Don't touch the thing. That's there. Don't touch it. You go away. They've touched it. Yeah? And we were doing that from a toddler age. We still do it now. Don't touch that thing. Don't click on that button on the internet. We still do it now. Yeah? It doesn't change. It's what, we, it's what we're, we're like. We look at the thing. We get curious. We look at the things that we shouldn't look at. Um, and we're tempted into them. It's part of our nature. We will always choose to do things that suit us. We always will. The flesh, it says in the word of God, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, we are always, we want to try and do what God wants us to do. We want to try and do what's right, but we're always going to do what we like. And sometimes what we like is not always what's right. And so these conditions were put in place. They broke it. Man and woman broke it. Adam and Eve get a lot of stick, and a lot of people say, if I see them in heaven, I'm going to have a strong word with them about the world that it is today. But the reality is, it could have been you, you would have done the same thing, because that's our nature. We can't do it for ourselves. We will fall short. And so we broke it. And, um, and sadly, what happened in that moment was what was an intimate, incredible relationship where God was meeting and having fellowship with man and woman in the garden um, was broken. Because a thing called sin, a word that people don't like to use anymore, came into the world. Um, sin is something that is against the God. It's, it's something that is, oh, God can't even go near it. It's, it's the opposite of him. God is good. Sin is bad. That's probably the best way of explaining it. But God can't go near it. If he's good, he can't touch it. And so um, as soon as sin came into the world, as soon as bad came into the world, it, it stopped that connection, that relationship, that walking with God, that whole reason for our very creation, the presence. Yeah, Remember that? The presence. That stopped in that moment. It was done. We couldn't connect with God anymore. But God loves us. God loves us. So he looks at the situation. He says, right, okay, they've messed up, you know, um, and they keep messing up. And we keep messing up. But he says, right, how about we put a system in place where um, the punishment for sin is death. That's what it says in the word of God. That means when we do things wrong, the punishment for doing it wrong is that we die. We, our, our wages, everyone on this planet, is that we should pay the punishment of death, every one of us. And so when sin entered the world, Adam and Eve, and then the generations after it, their punishment was death. But God didn't want that. God wanted a relationship. He wants intimacy, and he wants us to experience his presence. And so what happens in that, he says, right, let's put a system in place. But if the transaction for death is that someone has to die, then what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to have to sacrifice something. Something's going to have to take the place of those people. So he put a system in place where uh, an innocent animal, um, uh, it says a spotless animal, um, without blemish, was sacrificed in order to pay for the sins of the people. So every, every year or so, they would do something where they would sacrifice an animal. A priest would stand in the place um, of the people, and the presence of God was able to come, but only into a tent. And it was just in this place. So God was there. The presence was back on the earth, but not the way God had planned it. It was meant to be that we were walking in fellowship in the garden, talking to God, knowing him, 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 him feeding, fill, um, filling us with, with, with him and who he is. So we get to know him more intimately. But, but that wasn't possible because we allowed sin to enter the world. So what happens is that um, God creates this system where there, 
an animal will take the place of the people, the, a, a, a sacrifice of an animal. And, and many households will have their own and they would bring them. Um, and it would atone for, it's a word called atonement, atone for their sins. And it would be uh, not the best way, not the way that God wanted it, but it was just a way. But over time, just like in the garden, man messes it up again. Man keeps trying to do it his way, try to fix it his way. Like we all try and do. Does anyone ever try to fix things their way, then go to God like 15th on the list? Yeah? All of you. Put your hands up. Yeah, so we all do it. Yeah, we all do it. We all go, we think, I can do it. I can fix it. I can get it right. And we keep doing it. We keep doing it. And then, and then the last resort is, why don't I just ask God? He did it last time. He might do it this time. And that's, that's the problem is we are, that's what we're like. We try and fix things. Or we try to repair it. We try to think, I can, I can take care of my sin. I can deal with it. People that are in addictions and struggles um, like, like that sometimes think, if I can just wake up tomorrow and be different tomorrow, I'll be different. I can do it. I can do it. But we can't do it. We can't do it. We, ha- we need God to help us through it. We need the power of God to get us through it. And so um, this situation gets worse. And there's uh, a, a few thousand, over a few thousand years, the system is in place, but the system doesn't really work because man keeps messing about with the system. The system could have worked, but man keeps messing about with it. And we know that there's a blood atonement, that we know that blood has to take place of, of, of the sins of people. We are all punishable of death through sin. And we're all sinners. We all have to pay that price. And so what happens is um, God does this most amazing, incredible thing. And I've shared this before with the church. But he made this decision before he even created you. Just think about this. He made this decision before he even created us. Because he's God. That's how much God loves you. And so what God does is he says, do you know what? This ain't working. We need something to just deal with this once and for all. So that we can get back that intimate relationship with our creation. And Jesus is there. And Jesus says, I'll do it. I'll go. And what he means by that is I'll be that sacrifice. I will be, instead of the animal that has to be sacrificed every year, I will be the ultimate sacrifice. I'll be that unblemished Innocent lamb, I will do it. So the whole point of right now and what we're in right now is the honoring of the greatest Christmas present that we could ever have. It's the giving of the greatest gift where Jesus comes down to earth and, and, and he starts his journey as a baby. But 30 years later, he becomes that sacrificial lamb. He pays the price. He dies for every single one of, these, of, of us on this planet. People that will still reject him because there's choice. People die not knowing Jesus. But it doesn't mean that he didn't want them to know him. He died for every single one of us. And we're in this time right now where the opportunity to, to um, look at the world and the way the world is right now. And how messed up it is. How hopeless it is. You know, the government, bless them, you know, they change their mind every two days because they don't know what they're doing. And they're the people that we're effectively employing to know what they're doing. And that's nothing against them. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. But what I'm saying is they've got to make, they're making decisions every two days that contradict the one that was two days before. They don't know what they're doing. And they're the ones we need to look at and go like, uh, what, what do we need to do? Tell us what we need to do. Okay, we'll do what you're doing, right? Okay, we're not doing that this time, right? We're going to do this. Okay, what we're doing, right? And that's what we're relying on. There's no hope in it. There's no hope in it and, and because they don't have any hope. They don't know where, where, to, where to go, where to, where to get answers. They're trying their best. And before all this stuff happened at the beginning of this year, uh, people had their hope in holidays, in their jobs, in finances, in health. There was no fear of death. People just thought we're going to live forever, that kind of mentality. Now everyone's really scared about even going to the shops. These things are in place. The hope that we had, the trust of the things that we had trust in, suddenly don't exist anymore. They're not there. There's no substance to them. There's no foundation to them. It's all crumbled away. And we're now in a world where we're like, what do we do? The government don't know what they're doing from one week to the next. I can't go on holiday. That's where I used to escape. I can't go and drink my weekend away because I'm not even the pubs aren't even open anymore. 
These are the things that people put their hope in. We're laughing, but people actually work like Monday to Friday to earn their money, to go to the pub for two days, and then they recover on the Sunday, and then they go, go, go it again. That's their life. That's how people live their life. That's been taken away as well. They don't have that. And they think, well, okay, I'll have some friends around. We can drink together. You're not allowed to have your mates around either. There's no hope. There's nothing. You can't put your hope and your substance into any of these things. The God, like Anne was praying, God is shaking this nation because it's all about his presence. And he wants us, this nation, to experience his presence. He created you to know him. He loves you that much. He cares about you that much. So like I said, Jesus... What happened is he had to become this sacrificial lamb, this unblemished lamb, and he was. He was he was completely innocent of all crime, of all sin, and yet he was still deemed worthy of being murdered. For some reason, they still felt that they had to murder him. They had to kill him. But what they didn't realize they were doing was they were sacrificing the ultimate lamb, the final lamb, the one that was going to atone for everyone's sins, not just in that moment, not just for that year, but for eternity. And Jesus paid the price. But let's just break this down. Jesus was beaten within one whip of what would kill a man. And if you've ever seen the film The Passion, you will know that it wasn't just a little whip on his back. It was ripping his skin off. It was, it was, it was brutal. And then he, after having that beating, after being spat on, as, after being ridiculed and, and, and just... Um, Basically, they, would, they, they stuck a crown of thorns on, it, on his head and, they, and that bled and that stuck in his head. And they, they mocked him. And he, all the time he could have just said, do you know what? Forget this. That's what I would have done. I'd be like, do you know what? Do you know who I am? I'm God. Have some lightning. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, that's what, but Jesus had, he couldn't do that. He couldn't cheat. He couldn't cheat, even though I'm sure... Well, I'm not sure you wanted to. I don't know. But I would have wanted to. And so, so the reality was he was being beaten, mocked, ridiculed all the time, all the way through it. Being told, like, who are you? I thought you were the king. I thought you were, the, I thought you were God. I thought you were here to rescue us. And what they didn't realize they were doing was actually rescuing themselves. Because what Jesus was going through at that moment was to go to the cross, to be nailed to that cross through his hands and through his feet. And to be there up naked, he wasn't up there with a loincloth. He was up there naked for everyone to see. He was, he was ridiculed. And even when he was up there, they were mocking him, saying, come on, get down. You can do this. Call your angels. Where are they? You know, who are you? Jesus knew that he had to go through it. He breathes his last breath. Or just before he breathes his last breath, he says, it is finished. The most incredible words we can ever hear. Because what that means is complete. It's accomplished. What that actually means is that there's nothing else that we need to do. You know the system we talked about? The choice that we have in the garden or the the system that God put in where we messed it up? It doesn't matter. We can't work at it. We can't. The choice is still there. We can choose God. Do you know you can choose God and still mess up? Because it's finished. It's accomplished. It's done. That's what he did. Because it's all about his presence. It's all about his presence. And all we need to do is open it. All we need to do is open this incredible present and receive it into our life. It's all about his presence. And we're in a world right now that doesn't know what it's doing. But we have a God that knows 100% what he's doing. And he knows what's coming. And we just need to be in relationship with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And we will be at peace. It says he gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. He gives us something that we can't explain. And he does. I can testify to that. Other people can testify to that in this room of knowing that there's this incredible peace that God gives you in the midst of the storm that doesn't make sense. Everyone else, have you ever had that? Probably here um, as a church where people are going, how is it that you're still standing? Why are you not so scared? Why are you not fearful? Why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing that? And you say, because I've got Jesus. That's literally what the answer is. Just got Jesus. It's all good. He helps me through the storm. In fact, Jesus says I can sleep through the storm. I'm not really good at that one yet. But that's what he did. He said, why are we worrying about it? Just have a nap. (laughs) Because Jesus has got it in control. He's taken care of it because it is finished. It is accomplished. We don't need to work at it. We don't need to earn it. We just need to unwrap it. The greatest presence ever given. His presence. And I want to encourage the church 
here today as well. I know there's visitors here, people that maybe don't know Jesus. They haven't experienced that presence, but also for the church here today, just to say, how much are we experiencing his presence? How much are we understanding the value of it? We were created to be in his presence. We were not created to be robots. We were not created to be slaves. We were not created for God just to stamp on us and say, get lower than me. Go on, get lower. We were created to have a relationship with the God of the universe so that we would experience his presence. And God has tried throughout the ages to put a system in place. And then it got to the greatest system that could ever be, the one that paid for our sins for good. Sin is bad. God is good. God, Jesus, listen to this. Jesus took on all our sins. He took on all the bad, all of our bad. Not just what you've done today. Not just what you did in the past. What you're going to do. He's done it. He's finished. He's paid it. And he put it all on him. And it says in that moment, he felt abandoned by God. Why? Because God is good and sin is bad. And Jesus, who was innocent, had every one of our the whole world, everyone's sin on him in that moment, atoning for our sins. He was taking that on. And it separated him from the Father. And like I've said before, before he even decided to create you, he knew that he was going to have to do this. He created you knowing that we were going to screw it up. Knowing we're going to mess it up. He knew it. And he still created us. Doesn't that mean something? So we go around today saying, I have no worth. I have no value. Who am I? Is there any purpose to me living? Is there any purpose to me even being here? Yeah. Because God created you to be in his presence, to know him. And he knew that he would actually have to die for you to go through that. And he did it anyway. If you want to know if you're loved, valued, if, you, if, there's, if there's someone that loves you or cares for you out there, yes, there is. Because he created you to know him and he knew the price he would have to pay for you to know him. And he did it anyway. He took it on. I just want to encourage you today that right now in this moment that we're in, the world is all over the place. But we're at a time called Christmas. And we're at an opportunity to unwrap the greatest gift we've ever been given. So I just want to give somebody an opportunity today to unwrap that gift. I want to say to someone today, you have the opportunity. You, maybe you came in here to see the nativity. It's coming. But maybe you came in here um, for, because it's a normal thing to do just before Christmas, go to church. But if you have not experienced the presence of God, you're missing out on the greatest gift you can have. And, and there's a passage in the Word of God where um, I think it's Peter and, and John are walking up to the temple. And there's a, a man who's crippled through his condition and he is uh, begging for money. And they say to him, silver and gold I cannot give you, but this we can. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he gets up and he walks. And that's the same for me today. I cannot give you money, I'm afraid. I cannot give you your, the toy that you want. I can't, I can't give you a, a large check in the post. Um, but what I can offer you today is Jesus Christ. I can say to you today, if you choose him, if you choose his presence, then you can rise up and you can walk. You can rise up and you can live. You see, we are all Every single one of us have gone astray. Every single one of us. It says every single, single one of us falls short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Every one of us. The punishment of sin is death. Yeah? The punishment of sin is death. That means that there's an eternal death for us to come or there's eternal life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one accesses heaven. No one gets into the presence no one gets eternal life except through me, except through Jesus Christ. It sounds arrogant. Oh, who's he to say that? Well, he's God. That's who he is. He gets to say it. He's not just this dude that was in history that was a nice guy. He was God that decided to come down into a fragile body and get battered, bruised, beaten to pay your price so that you would not have to pay eternal death, but you could have eternal life. Who's in that eternal life today? Who knows that they're secure? Do you know what? I don't want to die, but I don't, I don't fear death. 
I don't want to die. I don't want to be like, oh, I don't care. Let's just, you know, whatever. The world's all scared of death. No, I don't want to die. But I don't fear death because there's an eternity that God has put in me because he died for me. And he gave me the greatest present. And one day in the past, I got to unwrap that gift. And other people in this place got to unwrap that gift.